Hi, and welcome to another Inspiring Honesty. I'm your host, Greg Bray, and I'm an atheist. I have a quick story to tell you to open up the show today. See, Thursday was my mother-in-law's birthday, and for her birthday, we hosted a cookout. It was, it was wonderful because I'm an amazing cook, so the food was delicious, of course. But on the way out, uh, we, we watched a movie, settled down, relaxed, and on the way out, she sent me a text message asking for one final birthday gift. You see, there was a wreath out on the front of our house that we had forgotten about when taking down the rest of the Christmas decorations. And she sent a message <laughs> saying, hey, as an additional birthday present, can you take down that Christmas wreath that's still out there? And I'll tell you what, I got out there uh, right, uh, well, it was about it was about sundown um, on Friday then. I, I got out there and I took it down. But lo and behold, that sucker was right back up there today. I don't know what happened. I, uh, apparently, you can't some, or take something Christmas down on Good Friday. So with that, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about, of course, the holiday of the day, the the spring solstice, or the, I'm sorry, the spring equinox that we're all here celebrating, and how that has been adapted into um, the Christian worldview and the theology that surrounds it. Now, of course, we need to talk about a lot of things. This is a big holiday. It's the core holiday to the Christian tradition. If it weren't for Easter, to most Christians, Christianity would be meaningless. If this is not, if the the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ did not happen, then there has been no redemption, or or even if he was not actually the Christ, the Messiah, then then most traditional Christian theology has some serious issues. And today, of course, I'll be joined by my wonderful co-host, Bob Graves, the unconventional pastor. And I know that he has a very different take on the, the death and resurrection story of Jesus. But I wanted to talk with him about that. And really, I, I have the pleasure this time of letting a Christian tear into that Christian theology. So I'm just going to sit back and, and watch for the most part and, and have a good time with this show today. So... Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Egg Day. Happy Zombie Jesus Day. Whatever you'd like to call it. Remember, this is as much a secular holiday as it is a Christian holiday. And I had a great Easter brunch this morning. So I have no problem saying Happy Easter as much as I have no problem saying Merry Christmas. And with that, Bob, Happy Easter. Well, well thank you. Happy Easter to you. You know what? Thank I think you. it's just wonderful how you you gave that that testimony of how God was working in your life, demonstrating to you through the actual resurrection of a Christmas wreath, the the reality of Easter. That's amazing <laughs> to me. <laughs> no, what's funny is that it's a true story and everything except what actually happened. <laughs> it's almost like scripture in that way. No, she she sent a text asking me to take it down, and I just replied to her that I couldn't take it down on Friday because it would just be up again today. So, I, it uh, it would have been great, but I I have noted today and and actually in a discussion today um, that. It doesn't matter if a story is true as long as it's a good story. And I think that that speaks a lot to what this holiday <laughs> is about as well. <laughs> well, there you go. I've been exposed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you know, I'll tell you, um, I'm sort of like uh, I have uh, – it may appear that I seem to have a foot in one world and a foot in the other because uh, – and, and it's not that I, I do. It's, it's that um, there are aspects of the Easter story that I think are onto something that I would as a theist believe. But I do see a great deal about the story to be um, you know, something that needs to be held – uh, in question in various ways. Um, for one thing, I, I don't know that uh, Easter is really a holiday. Um, uh, I, I don't know that it's something that, uh, I mean, why should we be celebrating it every year? I, I, I don't get that. I don't understand that. I don't see what the, the value in it is um, to do that. 
Um, I, I think that what it tends to do, uh, to be honest with you, you know, to, to take a look at Christmas every year and take a look at Easter every year, I think this is part of what causes Christianity itself to be kind of lame and that we really don't have to think about being um, honest to our faith dev- day after day after day after day. We can simply focus on uh, what we think of as the reality of his arrival on one particular holiday and on another holiday, think about the uh, the reality of uh, of this sacrifice that uh, that uh, that occurred and the way we think of it, and we can really kind of focus most of our attention around those aspects in those holidays, and we don't have to think about whether or not this is a practical part or a realistic part of our lives uh, day in and day out. And I think that in many ways, these these Christian calendars are a way of, of I can un- understand and appreciate how, uh, you know, it's helpful to sometimes have some routines to keep oneself disciplined and 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 at work at things that are important but sometimes they can become such a rut that it's actually a way of avoiding issues until we finally get around to talking about it and then when we get around to talking about it we only talk about it in a traditional manner and for the most part it doesn't really make any difference in our lives and so you know I'm not I'm not a big fan of Christmas or Easter in fact at our house we love Christmas and I don't I can't remember the last time we even had a Christmas where we even talked about the birth of Jesus. Uh, we we give gifts to each other. We 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 enjoy the uh the fact that everyone is talking about peace on earth and goodwill to men and and uh we enjoy the uh uh the the festiveness of it and we really do and and I ask it's not really to me anything significant in terms of my personal faith. Which I well, you know, I, I have to tell have. you, you're, you're ruining Christianity for me here a little bit. I mean, oh, I, as an atheist, uh, the biggest benefits that I get from Christianity are gifts on Christmas and Easter baskets <laughs> with candy in them. So yeah. it's, uh, you know, if you would like to do away with those things, can we at least keep the secular side of it? Because uh, oh, I mean, a jolly oh, yeah, absolutely. No, that, I, I do celebrate. Uh, I celebrate uh, Christmas as as a um, as a secular holiday. I do, and I like it. I think it's wonderful. I'll tell you, there was a time as a Christian where I didn't understand the the robbing from pagans their holiday and trying to displace it with some kind of mocked up, made up regularity traditions of our own to, as a way of just trying to get those pagans to let go of their religions. And, uh, and to me, that struck me as, as having as much integrity as stealing this land from the Indians and calling it uh, freedom and democracy. But um, I – so in my younger years um, as, as a Christian, I refused to have anything to do with Christmas. I didn't celebrate it at all in any manner. And finally, I fell in love with it as a wonderful holiday that had nothing to do with Christianity. And so, and I'm I'm kind of still that way. I, I'm just not well, as adamant about it. About it. If other people want to turn it into what they think of as a regular holiday, I see you know, they can do that. It doesn't bother me any, uh, but it's not meaningful to me as a as a Christian holiday at all. But it's a wonderful time. We we love it. We we get lots of gifts, and we uh, we we make it a wonderful family time. Now, and frankly, it doesn't have much to do with the holiday itself. I mean, the the dates that we pick for these things are relatively are relatively arbitrary. And what I learned today that I did not know, I actually spent some time looking into exactly why Easter is celebrated in the random, you know, March 22nd through April 25th time frame that it is. And I learned that it has, it's the, now let, let me remember this because I'm, I'm shooting off the top of my head here, but it's, it's the first Sunday after a full moon after the spring equinox, I believe. Correct. Because it's, however, it cannot coincide with Passover. If it, were to coincide with Passover, then they bump it back. It goes to the following Sunday, which is, which is odd because this is thought to have happened on a Passover in the first place. It, it, so exactly, exactly. If if anything, uh, it shouldn't be celebrated. Uh, now, the, one of the problems they had was that I think that Passover doesn't always occur on a Sunday, you know, or on a Friday, or on a. Well, you know, of course, I think there's a lot of myth in in terms of the Passion Week and all that, um, and. 
and I'll be honest with you, I don't think it's all that important, but I think it's interesting to take a look at it. For example, you know, um, when, was Jesus speaking literally or figuratively when he said three days and three nights? I mean, because when you think about it, go from Friday to Sunday, there's no there's no three days, three nights. It just doesn't work. Well, particularly after the equinox, we're talking less than 36 hours from sundown on Friday until sun up on yeah. Friday morning. And we don't even know what time because the tomb was already empty by the time the sun rose. On, right. On it, it, the Bible it, it nowhere claims that Jesus on rose Saturday. on Sunday morning. Nowhere. It isn't there. That's just when they found the empty tomb. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, and that's one of those uh, and, things that I really wanted to focus on a little bit today is there is a, a fantastic quiz out there. Um, I know it, it's skepticmoney.com just ran it, but it's it's been out for more. I'm looking for the, the name of the author right now. Um, David Fitzgerald. It is a a quiz about Easter and it's it's wonderful. The questions are uh, simple and pretty straightforward. Things that people should be able to answer. You, give, you hand somebody a Bible and say, hey, when, when did Jesus get crucified? Here's the Bible. Let me know. And and what's interesting is there's either at the third hour, 9 a.m. on a Friday or the morning of Passover, or I'm sorry, on Friday, the morning of Passover, or um, shortly after the, the sixth hour, which would be noon uh, on Friday, the day before Passover, because Passover is not always on a Friday, um, he didn't really get crucified, but his identical twin, Thomas Didymus, did is one of the options that uh, has been believed by Christian tradition. Um, or he didn't really get crucified. He only appeared to be crucified. That's another one. Um, it's it, we can't we can't reconcile because all of these things have been part of Christian traditions. And specifically, the the first two, whether it was on Friday of Passover or Friday the day before Passover, um, those are both actually right out of the Scripture. And they're they're completely incongruous. There's no way to to meld the two together. Either it was Passover that day or it wasn't. Um, there, there's so many more things. The things that happened: an earthquake hits Jerusalem, supernatural darkness covers the land, a sacred temple curtain spontaneously splits down the middle and rends itself to show the holy sea behind it. And and there's a mass resurrection. A zombie apocalypse goes on. Mm -hmm. um, Within the streets like of Jerusalem, of where that. all the, but, the Jewish know, men are I, breaking. I think, I think that there's a there's one of the problems that we have is that a lot of the Christian tradition is based upon, you know, taking snippets from the text that are not necessarily entirely understood and trying to fill it in with a coherent story from front to back. Uh, based on those snippets. However, this tradition was developed at a time when the church was in a strong phase of anti-Semitism. And as a result, they didn't really care about Jews. They didn't care about Jewish tradition. They didn't know a lot about Jewish tradition. They didn't want to know about Jewish tradition. And some of the things that they that they really remained ignorant of were things like this. A Jewish day actually begins at sundown. So that there's a sense in which, um, for example, uh, when does Sunday begin for a, a, a for Jewish culture? It begins around six o'clock on Saturday night, you know, and so you got that problem. The other problem is that they didn't realize at that time is that the word Sabbath was not just used for Saturdays. It was also used for any other particular holy day. And uh, it is thought by many people that the Passover didn't actually occur on a Saturday. It occurred on a Thursday or a Wednesday that that particular week. And so that uh, and there are some people who would want to argue that Jesus was actually um, sacrificed on a Wednesday. But because Thursday was the Passover, uh, that before Thursday, Thursday began, which would be, you know, around six o'clock at night, he was taken down from the cross and that uh, they couldn't get there to the uh, the uh, the grave the following day because it was a holy day. And then the following day, they were concerned about somebody trying to move the stone. And so they had to go that day because the day following Friday was going to be another Sabbath. So there are two Sabbaths that week. And then they – so this is another reason why they couldn't get to the grave to try to prepare things until Sunday morning because of all these other problems that were rising. And I think that the early church didn't understand or appreciate some of these um, 
calendar type math problems and they developed all these traditions and then have a need to defend them. Um, and I'm not saying that therefore I've got it all figured out and I know what the answers are, how to put this all together. But I am saying that a great deal of confusion about what was going on and an attempt to explain it um, has has transpired so that by the time we're done, we're, we're, we're end up really defending a bunch of stuff we just made up. Well, and it, what's interesting, though, is that there are things in there that are pretty concrete, such as um, there were women that went to the tomb, uh, mm. according to the story. But but then if you ask which women and or when they went there is also difficult. What they saw when they got there, how many people were there? It's I mean some of them were described as as young men, some of them were described as angels. I can see reconciling the two of those pretty easily. But one or two of them, that's a pretty difficult uh, uh, conundrum there to try to put. Wait, which story do we trust? The one that there was one guy there, or the one that there were two, or it's well, just, you know, trust and is an interesting. The reason word. that I'm bringing all this um, up, though, is because it really brings up the issue of literalism, and doesn't and it? Doesn't it? This and also, thing. I think you ought to bring up another issue in Jewish culture when you're telling a story. How important is it that the details are accurate, or that the details? convey a gist of intent, meaning, and how to relate to it. In that culture, I don't think that those details were always that important. So if one version of the story had one person and one, another version of the story had had two people, I, from, from a Jewish standpoint, I don't know that anybody would say, oh, yeah, and, you know, the, the number of people wasn't the point. You know, and so they don't see a problem with that. It's we Westerners who want a story to contain accurate details because you see, I want to be able to determine whether or not what you're saying to me is even really viable or not. Uh, you know, so I think from one culture to another, we don't know that that was even their care. And so although we see that as a contradiction, we wouldn't do that in our literature. They had no problem doing stuff like that. Uh, well, and, 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 well, we and, do and need to be honest in saying that it is a well, contradiction, I, those whether that was in important to them or not. You know, is, we're, we're, uh, can you, um, I, you're breaking up on me, so I couldn't quite hear you. But how long have those texts been in existence? Do you think that the people who originally put those texts together were like, oops, we made a mistake. Over here we said this, but over here we said that. Uh-oh. You know, no, they knew those things were there and you don't see redactive attempts to correct it because it wasn't an issue. You know, that wasn't the point. There's a, like even like the testimony that Paul gives when he's on the road to Damascus and he talks about, you know, he saw a great light, but he didn't hear a sound or, or this and that. Or, the, you know, it, it, there's some contradictions in the details here. I think that, you know, it, as Paul told the story, the, the point is he was startled by this and, and, and various different things to his sense of perception were going on. And, and the point is that he was, you know, the rug is ripped out from under him. And that's his story. And he's not trying to tell you. Now, you see, the specific way in which the rug was ripped out from under me is that the first thing that happened, this is not what he's doing, you know. And and so consequently, uh, you know, not in that, but we have demonstrated psychologically that when people remember things from the past, memory changes. And so when we give an honest representation of something we remember from 20 years ago, if we were to hear a recording of what we said about it 20 years ago, there would be a ton of details that are different. What does that prove? Nothing. It, well, it proves that we cannot rely entirely on our memory to know what actually happened. And that's, that's so whether that's true. important and, or not. And I even say it proves that we cannot rely on the text to know exactly what happened. Right. Well, because somebody's going to interpret it at the time. I mean, the text is, of course, yeah. through the eyes of the beholder. This is, I think we've talked a little bit about this in the past, that if I were to actually murder somebody, I'd be asking for a jury trial um, because it's pretty easy to sway jurors that are not making their opinions based on evidence as compared to a judge. Whereas if I didn't do it, there is no way I'm going to let an emotionally biased juror or jury make this decision because they're going to take into account eyewitness testimony as the most damning kind of evidence that, well, somebody saw him do it. And it has been shown time and time again that eyewitness testimony is the worst kind of evidence. Yes, sure. It is the most sure. unreliable. So, I mean, yeah. that's, and, and, and this and is you know eyewitness testimony. This is not I, even to be honest with testimony. you, 
I really don't think that eyewitness testimony is unreliable. I just don't think it's reliable for what we think it's reliable for. It's reliable for something else. And that is the thing we don't want to do. It's the same thing with emotions. People think that emotions are inept reality detectors. Emotions are a reflection of your previous summaries of perception. And as a result, you know, it's only as good as your, your previous assumptions of, of perception. And so you're, you're, and there's a sense in which you can rely entirely on your emotions. You just can't always rely on your perceptions, but your emotions are going to be an accurate representation of your perceptions. And so, you know, when we, when we miscategorize and, and try to give credibility to something as if it possessed a certain kind of credibility, when it really possesses an entirely different kind of credibility, and this is true, I think, of eye, eyewitnesses. Uh, when people give you an eyewitness, they are telling you how they experienced the event. And that may or They're may not have anything to do with what actually I mean, really we happened. Be, we need to be cognizant of the fact that eyewitness testimony is a, a practice of interviewing somebody and asking them questions about an event. Now, this is not just a person whimsically recalling an event, which which is unreliable to, to a large extent if you're looking for it as a, a factual play-by-play -play of exactly <laughs> what happened. But it, it may be even more accurate because – it's less likely for somebody to feel a need for the story to be perfectly contiguous and therefore mm -hmm. make stuff up to fill in the gaps. It's something right. that humans are really good at recognizing when something's not adding up and making minor adjustments to make it work as we go without even realizing that we're doing it. Uh, yeah. so I would argue that all questions in a courtroom are leading questions. Uh, it's just that some are far more obviously leading than others. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree on that one. And I, I guess the reason I wanted to focus on on the story there and specifically the contradictions and, and what can and cannot be taken away from this um, is just because so much weight is put on the literal understanding of the passion of the resurrection and of every, the events that actually happened that day as if this is a historical account. I mm -hmm. will make the assertion now as I've always made it before, this is mythology. That does not mean that it cannot contain any kernels of truth or even profound truths of a different nature than historical. But mythology is, it has a definition as far as the... Um, the category is concerned from uh, literature studies, and that is what this story is. There's nothing else that we can call it that that gives it. Or that well, does you it know, justice. even without regard to how we how we might want to, you know, how what words we might want to use to describe it, the the very fact, uh, you know, any real event, particularly a, a, an event, uh, let's just for the sake of argument. Uh, Let's pretend just for the sake of argument that Jesus did rise from the dead. I can't imagine how that could actually happen without being somewhat of a discombobulating um, experience for those who, who confront that which appears to be the, the evidence of it. And, and I would expect that these people would in such a discombobulated state not be able to think clearly. Or even recall clearly. And so uh, even uh, – now I am a person who would accept the reality of that resurrection, but I don't accept the testimony of it as necessarily being the reflected testimony of people who were completely in charge of all of their faculties in making sense of this absurd contradiction of expectation. Uh, and and as a result, you know, I can I can fully own the fact that it is an absolutely absurd claim. It 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 defies um, uh, appropriate expectation. So I, I guess I'm confused. I thought that you were of the the opinion that the resurrection was a historical event. 
I am. I am. I, I, I believe the, the resurrection really happened. I just don't believe that the testimony concerning it is, is a reliable testimony in terms of its details and its accuracy. I think rather what it is is it's the, the outworking of the discombobulated minds of the people who were just uh, set aback by the, uh, the, the, the oddity of it, the strangeness of it. I mean, you know, they lost Jesus, the person they really thought was going to somehow maybe get rid of Rome or maybe do this or maybe do that. I don't think they had a clear understanding of what he was going to do. And then he gets murdered. He's taken away. And they're thinking like, well, what are we doing now? And then, and, and then, then he shows up, as it were, and, and they're thinking, I mean, they don't know what's up, what's down, whether to go this way, that way. What's going on here? They've got to be in deep confusion. And, and in such a state of mind, I don't see how it's possible that the way they relate to it later can possibly be that which is an accurate representation of what happened, in what order, and just how it's sequenced. I, I, it can't be. I mean, you know. Um, I, when I've talked to other people who have seen unusual events, th their, their rendering of it, even if you can later verify that something really unusual happened or, or that, you know, I mean, maybe somebody has, for example, if they, if they were a witness to a horrific crime, uh, many times the state of mind that they're in when they're, when they're actually witnessing something that's so horrific is one that actually disturbs the clarity of their thinking. This doesn't mean that, aha, we found some contradictions in what they are saying that, that the horrific event never took place. But I think it is to say that when, when people experience certain events that, that may be just totally um, outrageous in terms of their logic, I don't think it's um, – uh, it, it's almost uh, – it's, it's as unbelievable that they could recall it with clarity as it is unbelievable that the event took place itself. Well, that's assuming though that they don't have any sort of divine influence in, in adjusting their memory. That's the argument being made here for inspired scripture is that it's not uh, just that convenient? person's memory that's coming, but it's actually yeah. the the – the Holy Spirit speaking through these people. So you well, think sort that, of, yeah, hey, you know, although the Bible does talk about how, and when Jesus was, is quoted as saying the Holy Spirit will bring back to your memory, uh, the things that I had said, uh, Jesus may have said that, but you know, just because he said the Holy Spirit will bring back to your memory, the things that were said, doesn't mean that they would necessarily understand it or that they'd be able to make sense of it. Just recall it. And, 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 and I think that we, they take that and then take this huge jump that I believe exists for no other reason than to try to make my faith and the way I understand it somehow authoritative in a way where I can just put your version down. And to me, that, that's like cheating at arm wrestling. You know, I, I, it, it, you know it, it just doesn't work for me. And, and I think that it's a misuse of the text and what it was that, that, that Jesus said. Uh, when it comes down to it, we are on our own and we need to be on our own or we can't be honest when we're seeking to make sense of things. Now, there may be things we find ourselves confronted with having to make sense of that we don't generate ourselves, but <laughs> it's still, we are still left to ourselves to make sense of the events that we are perceiving. And so, you know, I, I think that Christians, uh, some mean well, but I think some are absolutely lying and uh, deliberately so in trying to create an authoritative version of the story and of the gospel that is somehow based on some authoritative revelation from God. And, uh, and, and I think they're just making stuff up or stretching the truth or wanting to be able to stretch it or gullibly believing when they've been preached to that this is what you can do, that they can do this, but, or one way or another. But I'll tell you this, you know, I've looked at the text. I don't see the text as giving me any such permission to do that. You know, I have certain opinions about what I understand and believe. And you know what? They're my opinions. I can't rely on any authority from God to try to make you feel like you should uh, take anything that I say as having any um, compelling evidence that somehow requires of you anything. You know, I, I, that, that's personally how I see it. Well, I, I think that there is an important distinction that I, I, was, I, I want to emphasize more in calling it mythology because there's – there's value to mythology, and actually, the things that oh, we've yeah. been discussing are indicators um, that we don't necessarily understand in our cultural context the way that something of this nature might be indicated. But let me put it into perspective here. If I were to start a story by saying, 
Once upon a time. Do you expect this yeah. story to then contain historical fact? No, no, that's not at an all. indicator line. It tells no. the reader or the listener that this is an allegory or it is it is a story. Exactly. And that, I yeah. think, is why we have these these gospels and these things that have these very obvious contradictions, the, and that were con- continued for a reason. Is had they tried to meld them together, they would have lost that very clear indication that this is not meant to be taken as an right. absolute. And, and because we're English fact. speakers, and because every language develops those signals arbitrarily and differently. Uh, for example, if we were to, if I were to write a story that began with once upon a time and then you translate that story into Vietnamese and a Vietnamese child reads it, they would not necessarily know that oh this is beginning with once upon a time, oh that means it's a fiction. That's not necessarily true in their in their culture. Uh, I, I, another example of this is the chiastic nature of um, uh, of Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two. There's certain kinds of uh, linguistic structures that go on that that tell me these two sections of text aren't even trying to be literal. The 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 nature of the structure of Genesis chapter one involves a great number of parallelisms and triads, whereas the, the creation story in Genesis chapter two is very much focused on distinctions and contrasts. And I see them as both being very different myths that aren't even consistent in terms of the order of what came. Was it man, then animals, and then Eve and whatever? You know, I and and I don't think that the people who put that text together were saying Oh, oops! We, we we overlooked a problem here. You know, we 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 gave a slightly different story, and, and, and I no. Each of them had their own linguistic, structural, uh, analogous purpose, and they were given for what they perceived that purpose to be. And then along come Westerners who know nothing about the linguistic elements of that particular language. They read it and they take it seriously as if it had the exact same sense in English that it had in Hebrew and use the exact same linguistic elements. And since they don't see anything in English that tells them this is not literal, they say, well, it must be the literal truth. To me, that demonstrates as I am, you know, as as a person who's studied linguistic anthropology, that strikes me as being um, yeah, kind of unlearned and, and sort of ignorant. <laughs> well, we, we have a viewer comment here. Um, somebody just wanted to tell you, Bob, that they really appreciate your take on the resurrection testimonies. Um, but then they also commented that, in a sense, if the testimonies really did have absolutely zero contradiction, absolute perfect unity, this would be more reason for suspicion than if they <sighs> were as they are, which is to say, well, yes, very I, I totally agree with you. When, when, when stories are too coherent, when stories are too congruent with other stories, uh, collusion ought to be a serious consideration. I agree with that. Uh, hey, you as know, long as, as a we person understand sometimes the way that to, people remember. Had, hold again. I, as long as we understand the way that people remember and the way that people perceive things, we should know that no two stories should ever have perfect synchronicity. It's just not how human minds work. But two different yeah. authors, even a single author telling it a year or two apart is going to have a very different story. So it's just... It's, yeah, it's kind of like true. many of the discussions you and I have had. We're both telling our other friends about how we both, how each of us really won the issue. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, well, I obviously win every time from any objective exactly. views. Exactly. Yeah. Were, but... Uh, <laughs> it, it's so true. Now, I, I did want to say we're we've got only about fifteen minutes left, and we focused a lot about the the mythology, the story, and and the literal understanding of this. But there's another major issue that comes by it comes around this subject, and I know that this is something that you personally feel very strongly about, as well as Dr. Jones and the New Covenant Group speaks a lot about in general um, the the harm of religion and of bad faith. And this is one of those issues that, as I said before, the core of Christianity and so many understandings of the term are based around this event as a substitution, a and let's call a spade a spade here, a human sacrifice to redeem the, the illness that is sin in humans so that God the Creator doesn't or didn't need to punish us eternally for uh, some arbitrary breaking arbitrary rules that he knew we weren't going to be able to follow anyway it's right. it's a bad 
bad theology and it's harmful. And I just, I want to give you a few minutes to pontificate on that from your, your Christian unconventional pastor position, Bob, tell us why that's a bad thing. It, it just, it's, it's a, it's a crazy idea that, um, you know, first of all, if God was really that angry with us because of how wicked and awful and, and, and disgusting we are to him, I'm a little bit surprised that he would want to be so unethical and so dishonest as to actually want to redeem us. You know, uh, so you know, what is he? You know, it's, it's kind of like somebody, you know, sometimes you talk to somebody who's been in one bad relationship after another, after another, after another, and they never seem to learn. You know, you need some standards here in the people you choose to get connected with. You need to pick people who are not uh, not so overwhelmed with certain problems that they can't actually have a real relationship. And if we are the kind of people that the that this uh, penal substitution concept has, God is an idiot for wanting anything to do with us. Um, you know, so to me, that, 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 that strikes me as strange, but also, you know, uh, this doesn't make sense to me in terms of, so, okay, so he's, he's really pissed with us. So what he's going to do is he's going to beat his real son to a pulp and be satisfied with this and thereby say, okay, well, I'll love you guys again, so long as you're wearing this Jesus mask and I don't have to see your disgusting real face. You know, to me, that's a sick God. That's and he's playing a game of bait and switch and, and pretend that 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 lacks honesty. So, you know, to me, that that, that whole concept just doesn't doesn't work just from a logical standpoint, let alone what you know, people say, well, that's what it seems to be saying to me. And so, you know, I believe it. Well, you're gullible. You know, I, I don't understand that kind of um, blind reading. Um, you know, I, I perceive Jesus as someone who was was murdered. And the primary reason he was murdered was because he was willing to become the victim of a conspiracy and a murder uh, because he had a message of his presence to be among us that was going to upset the apple cart and contradict the traditionalists. And I'll tell you what, if you see a picture of Jesus all beaten and carrying the cross, you're seeing a picture of just what we do to people who dare contradict our traditions. That's what we do to them. And Jesus accepted that uh, as, you know, if you're going to treat me for evil, but I think as God, he knew he could come back. And so there's a sense in which, although it was a horrible thing to go through, he could come back. And I perceive the resurrection as Jesus saying, see, even if you decide you need to murder me, nothing is ever going to make me stop loving you. That's not the way I, that's not me. That's not what I do. I'm going to just continue on. And I think that he then disappears because he realizes this isn't going to work by having this constant physical realistic confrontation. People need to come to these realities from within. And I think it's the presence and the indwelling of Christ that makes this different. This is how I would understand it. So that we need to kind of get beyond ourselves, get beyond the religiosity of it. And to me, this is where the power of the resurrection and the power of the cross comes in, not in some sort of penal concept, but Jesus willing to play the game of this religious structure and to kind of turn it on its ear. And so, you know, that's, that's how I see it. That uh, I have to say, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that because I hope that there are a lot of Christians that watch this show. Um, I, I don't know how many would even be willing to, if they, they saw the first opening line in every show. Uh, but hey, it's something that uh, what you just said right there, if, that could be understood by every Christian that has come thumping their Bible and telling us that we need to repent or burn, the world would be a better place. Whether they, whether what, your understanding yeah. is even accurate or not, um, what they're it's telling still better you than this. What they're telling you a, is this, a humanist. my God is a hostile ass and he doesn't like you. He thinks you're a shit, basically. He doesn't like you, but he wants to make you an offer where you know, we got this deal going and it's kind of shady, you know, <laughs> but well, not now we're going to kind of switch. Uh, to me, that the message itself is, is begging people to come to a God who says, I can make you successful by being totally dishonest about who you are, what you are, and what I think about you and what your value really is as a person. 
Well, let me give a, or take a few minutes now to give the the atheist perspective on this one. Sure. Um, because I, I think that the nuance of the two of them will help to come together. One, as I said, I, I do not believe this story is literal fact in any way. I, I don't know if there really was a person named, named Jesus at the time. I, I would not be surprised. It, it seems like there's a lot of legend that grew up around this. But there was probably somebody named Jesus who was some sort of religious leader of the time, spreading a pretty good and pretty revolutionary message of love instead of this legalistic doctrine of, of hatred. And the result of that was he was murdered for blasphemy. He was executed by the religious people of his time because of the things that he said. And and that's granting a, a good deal of the story as accurate. And And I don't have a problem doing that. What I do have a problem with, however, is the theological understanding around that. First of all, the idea that this person was God and his actions were therefore exalted in some way really detracts from all of the other people who have sacrificed their lives for what they believe in. Because what Jesus did was a significant sacrifice. It was a very, very real and very hard thing to do. But he's certainly not alone in doing that. There have been literally millions and millions of people who have gone through a very similar ordeal, if not even worse, because of what they believed in. And to say that his doing it was special because he was the son of God really takes away from the value of what other people have done. Um, I think he's with the value of the message of Jesus, to be honest with you. Yes, I agree with you totally. <laughs> I, I also think that the idea that this was a monumental sacrifice for God to do, to send his son down to be to be tortured and sacrificed and then uh, to die is silly when coupled with the idea of a resurrection within 36 hours. Because it, realistically, yes, the suffering was ugly and it sucked, but but Jesus hardly died in the way that my grandparents are dead. It's he was gone for a couple days. Then he came back and chummed it up with his buddies. So that that seems like it really is taking away from the gravity of a death. And if God really, really needed to understand uh, empathetically the sacrifice of a parent losing their child, then exalting your son up to sit at your right hand within days of this or months or years, according. Well, I think it's 40 days was the longest span or just a very long time. It's they, they, There's another one of those contradictions. But that really doesn't seem like that's that's bringing a very strong sacrifice to God or, or a very strong empathy to God in that respect. So that's another thing that I find very... I would agree, I I would agree with your harmful. assessment in that, in that I, I, I think that the, the, the sense of the sacrifice being made is actually nothing more than a temporary um, uh, consideration. But then in the long run, you realize, oh, well, wait a minute. I guess that this really isn't that. But, you know, the truth is when you're going through it, how do those disciples know? You know, he, he was brutally murdered. He's gone. Uh, it turns out he's not, you know. And so therefore the truth, the truth is the death wasn't uh, – the, the death wasn't the same as the death of your grandfather. In that sense, it wasn't really at all. But then again, you know, during that, the, those few days, they didn't know that. That's true. The observers there didn't know it, but God did and yeah. Jesus did. Right. And so Jesus we're looking back at it divine. as if somehow it all fit together in some way. And then we're trying to, you know, yeah, then we're trying to somehow justify where they were in the process as if that's the where where we are today. And it's not. It's not. And I, so I agree with your assessment that the death of Christ is not the same thing as the death of another person. Well, and I'm specifically uh, in, talking about the perspective of respect. God. In this respect, let's not, let's let's put it this way. Let's not minimize the fact that um, I mean, I have never died. Uh, you know, I've had an NDE, of course, but I, but I've you know, I've never gone through the the horrific um, violence of being murdered. I, I can't imagine that that would be a wonderful experience for anybody, without regard to uh, their ability to kind of. Uh, spring back up magical right well item, I, i'm a, a bingo not presto whatever. talking about jesus but, in this respect i'm uh, talking about god uh, from yeah. the perspective of god sending his son down yes to go through a horrible ordeal but to know 
that within uh, relative time, you know, when we're talking about an eternal God, within less than the blink of an eye, his son's going to be back up there and healthy and happy and sitting right next to him and, and having a great time again. I, I yeah. think that, honestly, it, the separation of sending him to Earth for the 33 years he was alive would be harder for God than letting him die so he could come back up and hang out with him again. I, this is very anthropomorphic in that respect, but so is the Bible. So I'm OK with that rendition yeah. of the story. And and really, I just I find that to be a silly, silly understanding of it is that this was such a sacrifice for God. I think I talked about that when I I read I don't have the book handy, but there's a, a new Catholic handbook that uh, I think it's right here, actually. But my wife, there was um, nothing at risk. There was church. nothing at risk from God's standpoint at all. Exactly. Nothing. Yeah. And that's there was there was truly no no sacrifice in the same way that a human understands sacrifice from God. Yeah. It just was when, not when I sacrifice the same something, it's experience. just gone and it's gone and I'm ne it's never coming back. Right. And and that I think is an important message. And of course, the final one is that of the um penal substitution and the the idea that I and let's be frank again. This is a brutal murder, a torture and and very very obsessed with blood. Um, in, in a lot of ways. And of course, a lot of the early Hebrew and Christian culture was very much around that. And still the Catholics and, and the, the Eucharist, um, or not just the Catholics, but the, the communion idea of drinking the blood and eating the body to, to celebrate this event. Um, it, it seems like it's just macabre and it's a little twisted to say that the death of another individual, divine or not, can possibly atone for what you did. It's it's a whipping boy uh, idea. I, I just I can't understand how anybody can think that that is a good theology. It is a bypassing of responsibility. Now, there's one final thing I, I wanted to say. We don't have a lot of time left in the show, but my wife always criticizes me for being so negative on these things. And I say always because she doesn't actually watch my show. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about it afterwards. Um, so I will say one specific thing um, about this story in, in the way that she sees it, and I think the way that many other Christians do, is that uh, people like myself, and, and I think... To a large extent, you and Dr. Jones focus a lot on the negatives of this story. The the fact that it is penal substitution and it was a, a brutal murder for uh, the blasphemy and heresy. But there's also the other side of it. And a viewer just gave us a comment um, that says, but if a human being did it, then maybe I can too. And that, I think, is what this, this Easter story really brings to light in most of the minds of or the minds of most Christians who believe it. It's not about the passion. However much they have their children participate in passion plays, it's about the resurrection and it's about the hope mm -hmm. that that brings mm -hmm. to them mm -hmm. and the eternal life that that it is possibly granting to them. So we can't discount that respect uh, or, or that that part of it. And I can understand building an entire theology around a resurrection and a hope of eternal life and this being um, a very manifest understanding of that, but or a manifest uh, example of that. But well, it's I just think you the just rest passed it, your ordination inquiry. <laughs> I'm sorry I missed that. I, I said you just passed successfully your ordination inquiry. <laughs> All right. So the marriage that I performed is OK now. I think so. <laughs> Uh, I just uh, – sorry, we've got another viewer comment here. Um says, saying that Jesus Christ was the one and only Son of God not only takes away from what others did, it also takes away from what he did as a human being. After all, how could I achieve such heights of love when I'm not the one – or when I'm not the one and only Son of God? Um, that, I think, is a, a good comment as well, anonymous viewer, uh, that uh, – you're absolutely right. There's there's something in saying that Jesus – I mean the, the dichotomy that people throw out there of saying Jesus was fully human and fully God is impossible to be both because a full human is not fully God. 
And we don't right. understand well, you know, things I'll, in the way that a, well, a go, divine I'm sorry. Go ahead. Would. Finish. What Fisher um, was saying. So uh, I guess my, my final uh, – point on that one is that i think that that is a a marvelous way to understand the the problem with that way of thinking is that you're right if jesus is both fully human or was both fully human and fully god then jesus was not fully human and you cannot ever aspire to understand things in the way jesus did to feel things the way jesus well, did and it really I, takes I, away I, from in a lot sense of it, i would agree example. with you that it, there's a sense also in which i'd say we're not just fully human either because you see i i really think that the the, the that what we have uh, – to me what's central in the Christian faith, what as I understand is central to the Christian faith is that we are in union from a spiritual, inarticulate level that is beyond the material world, our essence of who it is we are as beings uh, be, uh, uh, apart from our bodies. We are in union with Christ and that union is one that will never end so that although our current condition and state is one that is very precarious, uh, our essence is not and we like Christ have that exact same nature. That's how I see it. And so uh, I don't see us as necessarily all that different, just not in the con the same state or with the same level of awareness. And as a result, we do not personally know that we too have nothing at risk. Well, thank you for that, Bob. We are all out of time. Um, it's, I'm getting the negative one minute mark here. So um, <laughs> join us again next week Nasty for Joey. Honesty. Uh, yes, yeah, that's uh, our, our belligerent Joey on the other end uh, sending me these viewer comments and then telling me I can't talk about them because we're out of time. However, I, I did want to say before I sign off that we will be joined next week by Sarah Moorhead from Recovering from Religion. And we're going to talk about the topic that we talked about today and more. So please join us for that and stick around after this for The Unconventional Pastor with Bob Graves. <laughs>